Okay, we're going to get started. Um, welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Mental Health is Essential series. And tonight's topic is Seasonal Affective Disorder. Our guest speaker tonight is Tracy Levine. Levine, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, from Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute for Mental Health Education at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Tracy is a licensed clinical social worker with over 30 years of experience in behavioral health and direct services. She is the executive director of Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute, as well as an assistant professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, and also board president of Mental Health America of the Northern Suburbs. Tracy is also an advocate for the coordination and implementation of trauma-informed community-based programming which fosters inclusive inclusivity and reduces stigma associated with mental health challenges. Okay, uh, and the title of tonight's presentation, Is It Just the Blues or Is It Sad? And I also wanted to say that tonight's meeting, tonight's session will be recorded and we will stop the recording once the Q&A starts at the end of the presentation. Okay, Tracy. Okay. Go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can all see just the, the introductory slide. Um, one of the things I will say as we do the presentation is that we recognize that people have different learning styles. And while some may feel frustrated that slides um, are being read, others need that in order to process the information that they're hearing to be able to visualize the words at the same time. So if we can keep that in mind, um, I promise not to read to you, just to be aware that I will be covering the information that's on the slides. So when we think about the winter blues, it's really just a, a general term. It's not a medical diagnosis. It's something that's fairly common, more mild than serious. Usually, especially living here in the Chicagoland area where we may see a lot of gray days, and we may have days of super cold weather, days we can't get out or do things. Um, we may feel gloomy, not in a great mood, wish we could see the sun. It's something that's going to kind of clear up on its own. And, you know, we look forward to those summer months when we can enjoy getting out, getting to the beach, the outside fairs and festivals and things like that. Um, you know, obviously pandemic conditions permitting. Some of the symptoms that we may see that may indicate more of a winter pattern, seasonal affective disorder is, I feel like I skipped something here. I did, I'm sorry, there's a slide that's, there we go. Um, not sure why that worked that way. What is seasonal affective disorder? So it is a form of major depressive disorder with seasonal pattern that usually occurs in the fall or winter. Seasonal affective disorder is not in and of itself a diagnosis. It is part of major depression. And as, as we kind of go through this, we'll see that there are things about seasonal affective disorder that really are resonant of depression. Um, what makes it different is that seasonal pattern. Full remission usually occurs at the same time every year, around spring or summer, when the days are longer, we see more light, we have warmer weather. Um, it's really related to the shortening of daylight hours. It can interfere with daily functioning over a significant period of time. And in order for that diagnosis with that seasonal pattern caveat to be applied, it means that it's occurred for at least two consecutive years, and usually in more more years than not over a person's lifetime, where every year about the same time that that depression sets in and it can really be directly connected to that change of seasons. Um, it was originally identified in the 1980s and um, was also kind of known as winter depression. Now that we know what it is, we can talk about those symptoms. Um, 
feeling listless, sad, or hopeless most of the day, nearly every day, losing interest in activities you once enjoyed, having low energy and feeling sluggish. And this goes above and beyond those days where you just feel like all I want to do is lay on the couch and watch a movie. We all might have those kind of days, but this is where it's, it's, it's really more of a constant feeling, having problems with sleeping too much, experiencing carbohydrate cravings, really wanting to eat that pasta and, and comfort food, overeating and weight gain, having difficulty concentrating or making decisions, feeling hopeless, worthless, or guilty, having thoughts of not wanting to live. So in its, its really most oppressive state, really feeling like maybe we wanna end that pain. Uh, social withdrawal or hibernating. And hibernating is really a descriptor that kind of goes with the seasonal affective disorder. It's that you know wanting to curl up, eat a lot, sleep a lot, that, that sort of characteristic hibernation phase. And there can also be heightened anxiety. Um, one of the things that as we look at the, the overlap with regular depression is that up to 70% of people with regular depression will feel worse during the winter months. But people with um, seasonal affective disorder often feel fine the rest of the year. Um, the symptoms, again, are very similar to those of major depression, uh, again, with that hibernation-like symptoms and cravings. And with depression, people might exhibit weight loss without being on a diet. So they may exhibit weight loss or weight gain. With seasonal affective disorder, we're going to see more of the weight gain. Um, and regular depression, we might see more insomnia, where with seasonal affective disorder, it's more of a just constant wanting to sleep. Symptoms can be mild, where they're distressing, but they're manageable. There might be some minor impairments in social or occupational functioning. So um, our interactions with our friends and family members, our ability to get up and go to work, to do what we need to do on a daily basis, uh, do what we need to do at home on a daily basis. But we're still, we're still doing it. There's just some mild um, interruptions or impairments with that moderate, where those symptoms are distressing, more distressing, may or may not be manageable, we're going to see more impairments in those social and occupational functioning, less able to do what we need to do when we need to do or what we want to do, um, or what we might normally want to do on any given day. And then severe, where those symptoms become very distressing and unmanageable and upsetting and inter noticeably interfere with that social and occupational functioning. We're not getting out of bed. We're not going to work. We're not doing any of the things that we should be doing to take care of ourselves, to take care of others, to perform our daily responsibilities. Um, it's really Im Im impairing uh, our, our daily life. In terms of prevalence, there are millions of American adults who may suffer from seasonal affective disorder, although many may not recognize that they have the condition. It is more common in those living farther north where there are shorter daylight hours in the winter. An estimated four to six percent of adults in the United States are affected. An additional 10 to 20 percent may experience a more mild form of the condition. An estimated 10 to 20% of recurrent depression cases follow that seasonal pattern. And then it is possible to have a summer pattern, seasonal affective disorder, but that does is more rare. I didn't find any statistics on that, um, but that predominant pattern does involve fall, winter depression with spring and summer remission. Um, of course, remission being that it goes away. Uh, the prevalence also ranges from the highest was 9.7% in New Hampshire to 1.4% in Florida. So the Sunshine State, certainly people have less, uh, less of a prevalence of that seasonal affective disorder. I was not able to find a number specific to what our percentage is for Illinois. Um, it's, when we... Uh, Obviously, certainly living in a place like Chicago, sometimes in the winter, right, we leave in the dark, we come home in the dark, assuming we're able to, um, or we are in a situation where we leave the house to go to work. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID next and how that's impacted. But the other thing to... Um, 
be aware of is that your chances of developing a seasonal affective disorder are greater if you have a first degree relative, like a parent or a sibling that also has battled with the condition or perhaps suffer with depression. About 15% of people with seasonal affective disorder also have a relative that suffers from the, from the same thing. With COVID, we know that um, even though, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. With seasonal affective disorder, people are more vulnerable to depression and stress, even though they commonly withdraw and isolate in the winter months. The pandemic has made those symptoms uh, more prevalent or more um, difficult to manage. For those without seasonal affective disorder, the pandemic has caused abnormal stress for some who now work from home and maintain a schedule that is not their norm. Um, if they can go, you know, where they can't go back to their pre-pandemic routines, which can contribute to poor diet habits and sleep patterns. Um, looking to see how can you establish a new sense of normalcy, including a consistent bedtime, a wake up time, aim for the routine. What's that daily routine of showering, dressing, eating meals at regular intervals for good mental health, finding activities that can be done every day, um, practicing positive thinking. Uh, I know I spoke with a colleague recently who said that they had had a realization that from working from home, that they could do different things with lunchtime, that they could make sure that they were actually being more planful with what they were eating and how they were eating and when they were taking their breaks. Um, given the increased time spent indoors, um, through the pandemic, feelings of depression may worsen or last beyond the winter months. And I had a discussion with my team today about this. It's like, you know, we're, we're spending more time indoors. A lot of people are spending more time outdoors, but it's really both is that maybe you used to enjoy having that time commuting to or from another location outside of the home, whether it was for work or for school um, or even activities, getting together with friends and just being cooped up in the house and not having those ways to get out anymore can be something that's going to make those feelings of depression worse. Um, and then, of course, many of our holidays and events may look different than what we love and know, especially um, family get togethers, people may not be having family reunions may not be celebrating holidays the same way. Um, we recently had um, good friends that had a death in the family and funerals look different. Um, and so even grieving isn't the same as, as what it was pre-pandemic and realizing how those things are going to impact us and to recognize also it's natural to feel sadness or even grief as even though we're two plus years into it, we all thought and we all keep thinking, eventually we're gonna get back to normal. Eventually we're gonna get back to normal and, and it just doesn't quite seem to happen. So sunshine, just 30 minutes of natural sunlight at a time, ideally in the morning, will raise our levels of um, serotonin, which is the feel-good transmitter, neurotransmitter that's in our brain. Uh, too little sunlight exposure can cause those serotonin levels to dip. Darkness also leads to production of melatonin, which can make us feel sluggish because melatonin is our body's way of saying, okay, it's time to go to sleep now. Uh, Dr. Norman Rosenthal, who's the psychiatrist whose research team identified and named the disorder, thought that getting sunshine or getting outside for 20 or 30 minutes a day could help. And that turned out to be right. When the sun is shining, if it's you know, if you're able to go outside, if it's not too cold, just going out and being there in the sun, feeling the sun on your face um, can really help as well as if it's too cold to go outside, find a place in your home where there's sun's coming in the window, even just sitting in front of the window, absorbing the sun, closing your eyes, feeling that sun on your skin can help with that um, getting that light that we're missing and craving so much when it's the winter months. I am not recommending any specific 
uh, treatments. I'm going to share some that have been found to be helpful. Certainly, there are things that people should consult with their doctors or medical professional uh, or other consultant about what might be the best for, for you. But light therapy, there are studies that have suggested that it is a very positive antidepressant that is effective in treating us in treating seasonal affective disorder. It's often used as the first line of treatment because there is a high response rate, positive response rate, 67% um, in patients with milder seasonal affective disorder, 40% for those with severe seasonal affective disorder. Uh, usually as, as sort of seen in this picture, delivered through a light box that has a reflector or diffusing screen. It does say patients sit in front of the light box with their eyes open for around 30 minutes at a time. So you may sit there uh, reading a book or um, even, you know, even if you're scrolling on your phone, having that light therapy um, being, uh, feeling that glow, feeling that light and, and absorbing it. Um, it mimics the effects of natural sunlight. The more light, the more serotonin our brains produce. Another impact is that um, research suggests taking vitamin D daily may improve depressive symptoms. Again, this isn't something you want to do without checking with your doctor. Um, I know I've joked with people that almost everybody we know has a low vitamin D level, according to our doctors. Um, and so what are the things? Sometimes we may take supplements, but there's also several vitamin D rich, rich foods, mushrooms, salmon, halibut, shrimp, oysters, cod. There are other fortified products, many of which are, are dairy products. Um, since less skin is exposed to sunlight during the colder months of the year, our vitamin D levels can drop, which can leave us more susceptible to depression, fatigue, and other things. Um, the doctor may have a, a blood test drawn to determine whether or not we would benefit from being able to take a supplement and then what that proper dosage might be, how many IUs or units per day that we would need to take. Uh, for some people, maintaining an adequate vitamin D level throughout the year is enough to reverse a seasonal affective disorder. Um, the other thing, as I was doing this research, I found that high quality dark chocolate containing 70% cocoa or higher has been shown to increase the brain's pleasure chemicals, including endorphins, serotonin, and dopamine. Plus, dark chocolate is high in protective anti antioxidants. Uh, the taste and smell alone can also provide a, a mood. So I am a huge proponent of, of dark chocolate. That is one of my favorite um, treatments for our, our depressing seasons. So when we look at what are some of the things that we can do if we've got the blues, if we're feeling down, if we feel like um, maybe we need, we need to just take care of ourselves a little bit more, is go for a walk on a sunny day. Even if it's a gray day, go for a walk, get some exercise, pick a new route, do something different with or without a dog. Um, this dog kind of made me chuckle. Um, eat healthfully, exercise, learn a new hobby or take an online class, call a friend or loved one or host a virtual gathering. There are several online um, games, Jackbox games. Um, there are other ones that are not coming to mind right now that can be a way to interact and have fun um, virtually when you're not able to get together and do it in person. I've even found some online um, where you can play card games, virtual card games uh, with, with friends when you can't get together. Uh, doing something nice for someone else, doing something nice for yourself, something you enjoy, practicing mindfulness, taking two minute breathing breaks. Research has shown that just two minutes of deep cleansing breaths can clear the cortisol which is the stress hormone in your system and, and bring you back to a calmer state. And then laugh. Laugh is certainly one of the best medicines. I'm going to share a little video. I need to make sure I am optimized. Okay. Ever 
have days when the whole world seems upside down and off kilter? Well, you can change that, and you can do it in less than a minute. Here's how. Grab a piece of paper, write down your name and the name of someone you know, then leave a blank space for a stranger's name. Got it? Good. Now, during the upcoming week, do something kind for each person on your list. It could be anything. Maybe it's treating yourself to something you love, raking your neighbor's leaves, or complimenting someone you don't know. That's it. Seem too simple? Well, it's not. Scientific studies show that random acts of kindness actually improve health and life satisfaction. They increase energy, optimism, self-worth, and our sense of belonging and connection in the world. Plus, they decrease anxiety, depression, and blood pressure. This transformation happens not only in the recipient and the giver of kindness, but surprisingly, also in the person who happens to witness the act of kindness. This means that if you do one act of kindness for one person today, and someone happens to witness it, you can, in that moment, improve the lives of three people. So do something that will make your future self proud. Share the power of kindness with all three people on your list. And who knows, if we get enough people practicing enough kindness, we might just set the world right again. So a little silly, but I thought it was a nice way to talk about how you can do something nice for someone else and do something nice for yourself. And a random act of kindness counts in both ways. So adding self-care to your morning routine, if you think about what is your morning routine, is checking in with how you're feeling a part of that process. Can you take some extra time to wake up slowly, to acknowledge and check in on your feelings? How am I feeling today? What am I going to be doing today? Um, what might I need to do for self-care or self-help today? And then choosing what you will do today and just being really focused on, on today's activities and what you need to do to have be, be um, in, in sync with yourself and knowing what your feelings are and what you might need to do to take care of yourself. And then adding self-care to your evening routine, um, having an evening routine that maybe uh, establishes an attitude of gratitude. And, and this can switch to the morning also. There is no specific time of day to do this, but to kind of think about, you know, quietly reflect um, on three things that you are grateful for today. If you do it in the morning, maybe you're thinking about three things that you were grateful for yesterday. But each day, the three things that you're grateful for must be different. And then you do this consistently for 21 days. You essentially rewire your brain. And your brain starts to retain a pattern of scanning the world for positive things instead of negative things. And it becomes challenging. It might be easy to, to say, well, today I'm grateful for my partner, my child, and my home. Now, tomorrow, I need to think of three different things and, and keeping a journal of that and really making your brain work on identifying those positive things that maybe aren't just the obvious ones. Self-help strategies. So when we move from self-care to self-help, self-care is, you know what, I need to take a bubble bath. I need to take a walk. I'm going to sit and have a piece of chocolate. I'm going to watch a movie. I'm going to do something that just feels good for me. When we cross over into self-help, we need, we need somebody else or something else for additional support. So maybe we're going to contact a friend. Who would you, who can you call 24 seven? Who's going to um, answer the phone or respond to a text message or be there for you no matter what? Who's that person that you can call? Um, calling or text a hotline or a warm line, uh, a helpline. And I have some resources on a slide um, coming up that have some of those numbers on it that um, you'll be able to take down or take a screenshot. Uh, make an appointment with a therapist. Uh, there are thing, people that... Um, places in Evanston that are available that you may be able to do either in-person or virtual appointments, but finding somebody to that to talk to, a professional to help you work through um, your feelings and depression and a seasonal affective disorder, if that's what you believe uh, 
feels like it might be having somebody that can actually diagnose that for you, joining a support group or social network, reaching out to a religious or spiritual leader or member of your congregation or faith community, and talking to your doctor or your helping professional about medication. Uh, there are some medications that you can be on short term. Helping others. Sometimes we're in a situation where maybe we're concerned about somebody, a family member, a friend, uh, what maybe we can do or not do as we reach out to help. What we don't wanna do is tell someone to snap out of it or get over it. Um, we don't want to adopt an over-involved or over-protective attitude towards someone who is depressed. We don't want to pretend that everything's going to be okay. We don't want to use a patronizing or condescending tone of voice or facial expression that shows an extreme look of concern or like, oh my gosh, what is going on? Um, we don't want to ignore, disagree with, or dismiss the person's feeling by saying something positive. Oh, you don't seem that bad to me, or everything's going to be okay. You know, get over it. It's fine. Um, just really take this feeling seriously and be as supportive as we possibly can. We want to treat that person with respect and dignity, listening non judgmentally, respecting that person's privacy and confidentiality. We want to offer consistent emotional support and understanding. Uh, in difficult times, we all need additional love and understanding. We want to remember to be empathetic, compassionate, and patient. We want to have realistic expectations. Accepting person as they are, tough times can make it harder than usual to do everyday activities like cleaning the house, paying bills, or feeding the dog. Um, we want to give people hope. Remind them that with time and treatment, they will feel better and there is hope for a more positive future. Provide practical help. Maybe we can help with tasks that seem overwhelming without taking over or encouraging dependency. Maybe we offer to bring over groceries or, hey, I'm going to the store. Can I pick something up and bring it back for you? Or I'm out running errands. What can I do to help? Um, Offer information, providing information and resources for additional support, including self-help strategies and professional help. And then talking about mental health and, and some of those myths and facts about mental health. That myth that mental health is not really important. It's just about thoughts and feelings. Fact is that caring for your mental health promotes overall wellness. And we want to think about our mental health as being just as important as our physical health. That we myth that we can't choose how we think about what's going on or what happened. If we work on being self-aware and mindful, we might be able to think about things in a different way. We may be able to reframe things um, and, and look at other, um, other ways to consider the events. If I, I'm weak, if I start to talk about my feelings, we're creating positive brain health when we start talking about our feelings. I I can't take care of myself and my family. My work needs me. If you take care of yourself and your family, you and your work will both benefit. It's kind of like that, that um, almost that oxygen mask analogy, right? We have to take care of ourselves first before we're going to be able to give our, ourselves and make sure that other people are okay. I don't have money or insurance to care for my mental health. There are free online screening tools, strategies, and resources. If I tell anyone that I'm taking care of my mental health, they'll say I'm crazy. We want to make sure that take, we know that taking care of our mental health decreases shame and stigma associated with brain health. And we want to work on using different language instead of saying, well, that's crazy. Maybe say, no, oh, that's wild. Instead of saying, oh, they have, they are, oh, she's obsessive compulsive or I'm obsessive compulsive. Just say something, you know, like, I really need this to be perfect. I really have perfectionistic tendencies. We don't want to assign mental health diagnoses or use mental health terminology in a negative way. I'm going to leave this up for a few minutes. This is um, some of the lines uh, or phone numbers we talked about. If you know how to take a screenshot, you can do that. Otherwise, I'll also bring it back up at the end of the training for people uh, to take it down. Suicide prevention lines include 1-800-273-TALK or 
that's 273-8255, 1-800-SUICIDE, so 1-800-784-2433. There's a 24-7 crisis text line, which is you can send a text to 741741. They also have a website, www.crisistextline.org. There are SAMHSA helplines that are, um, the first one here is specific for mental health and substance use disorders, um, which is 1-800-662-4357. And there's also for disaster survivors, um, can call or text 1-800-985-5990. One of the, uh, uh, mentioned a warm line, the Illinois warm line is 866-359-7953. And that's Monday through Saturday, eight to eight, except for holidays. And then there's also a friendship line for adults 60 and over or disabled adults 18 and over and their caregivers, which is 1-800-971-0016. And that's a 24-7-365 um, number. I also, um, a new service that is just getting started that will also serve Evanston is the Trilogy Mobile Crisis Unit. Uh, and that, I didn't have an opportunity to add that to the slide. That number is 1-800-322-8400. Um, if someone wants to pop that in the chat as I give it out, 1-800-322-8400. You leave a voicemail and they call back in five minutes and they have a van and they'll serve any age um, providing support and resources. Can you repeat that one more time, uh, Tracy? 1-800-322-8400. OK, thank you. OK. Um, some other resources um, in, um, we have at the Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute on our website, we have some links to external resources. Mental Health America is where you can go and there are some, uh, they do have all kinds of screening tests, tools available. Uh, depression Bipolar Support Alliance for people who may be struggling with depression. Um, mindful meditation. Mindfulness Meditations, this is a self-care. Uh, actually, before we close today, I'll share just a brief three-minute uh, mindfulness to close this out in a, in a calming place. What I like about this um, website is that they have um, resources in all, uh, in languages other than English. So it's, it's a really nice resource to share, especially with people where perhaps English is not their first language. And then um, mental first, mentalhealthfirstaid.org also has a number of resources available um, and blogs. And, and certainly there's mental health first aid training available, both for, uh, um, for adults who work with adults, for adults who work with youth, and there's also teen mental health first aid uh, for teens 15 to 18. So different kinds of resources there. And um, Irene, are the slides shared with the participants after the training? Yes, if you provide them, I'll share them with everyone that registered. Okay, I will do that. Um, and then we just have our references. Uh, this is where- Begin I... this meditation Ooh. by- Sorry. Begin this- Not really ready to do that yet. I, um, actually, I kind of went through that presentation a lot faster than I expected. We were only about 40 minutes in here. Um, so I think, Irene, if we want to go ahead and um, open it up for- for questions and because I really like to save the mindfulness for the closing. Okay. 